Hi, family. We're now in session five of the Doctrine of the Messianic Kingdom, and that's the Millennial Kingdom. That's that future thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. So I hope you have your Bibles ready and you have some snack to eat and something to drink. And if so, we're all prepared. Let's study God's Word together. And last time we saw that some very important teachings were introduced in Genesis. And these are important concepts that people have known about even from the time of Adam and Eve. And one important concept that we discussed last time was the headship of Adam and Christ. When we are born into this world, that is by natural birth, Adam is our head. He is the representative head of all mankind. And we are born into a lost race of people. And we are united with sin and death. But when we are born a supernatural birth, that is, when we are born again, we are born into a new race. We are united with Christ and we are justified. That is, we are declared righteous and we are granted eternal life. Not just spiritual life, but physical life as well. And we read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 and 22, which says, For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die so also in Christ all will be made alive. So under the headship of Adam, because of Adam's sin, we all die. However, when we believe in Christ, we are transferred to the headship of Christ. And because of what Christ has done, we will be made alive. We will be resurrected from the grave. Also, we saw last time that another important idea that was introduced to Adam and Eve, and to us too for that matter, is the Proto-Evangelium, or the Proto-Evangelion, which means the first gospel, the first good news. And we saw that in Genesis 3.15. The first good news is that God will raise up the seed of the woman, and we of course know now that that's Jesus, and he, Jesus, will completely defeat Satan. He will take back the realm of the earth from Satan's reign, and with that, comes the taking back of mankind from the power and control of Satan. The seed of the woman, that is Jesus, will redeem the earth, the kingdom, and mankind. And last time we saw what Dr. Tom Constable says regarding this first good news, this proto-evangelium. Dr. Constable says this, When Adam and Eve fell, they took themselves out from under God's authority, and put themselves under Satan's authority. Today, Satan is the authority under whom Adam and Eve's descendants lived. That's us. Nevertheless, God promised to raise up a descendant of the woman, that's Eve, who would conquer Satan and thereby enable mankind to fulfill the commission to rule under God's authority. In time, this seed proved to be Jesus Christ, who will one day return to earth to subdue his enemies and rule over the creation, thus fulfilling this commission. And Dr. Constable adds, this is really the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, we read that the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. This portion of scripture introduced to us the concept of substitutionary atonement. And we saw that substitutionary means another one takes our place, and that is Christ, of course. And atonement means that by Christ's sacrifice, Christ paid the price for our sins. The payment satisfied the just demands of God, and we are thereby reconciled to God. We saw that God is the offended party, we are the offenders. But instead of us paying restitution, instead of us paying the penalty, Christ pays it for us because we could never pay it. We spend an eternity in hell and we would still never pay this penalty. And when Christ makes the payment for us, we are reconciled to God. And we saw that this doctrine, the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement, is the heart of the gospel. Without the substitutionary atonement of Christ, there is no gospel. There is no good news. And the Bible tells us that Christ died for us. And that means that he died not only 
for our benefit, but he also died in our place. He took our place on the cross and suffered the wrath of God. God exhausted his wrath upon Jesus, the very wrath that was supposed to be for us, the very wrath that God was supposed to pour out on us, he poured out on Christ instead. He took it for us. Christ took it for us, not only for our benefit, but in our place. Now, this is such an incredibly important doctrine of the Bible that I want us to look into it just a little bit further. And you know what is also incredible is that there are some people who deny this doctrine. But not only do the scriptures reveal the substitutionary work of Christ, but even the mechanics of the Greek language, the individual words, point to Christ as our substitute. And I'll explain. Biblical scholars typically use three sources when they're seeking to understand the meaning of Greek words in the New Testament. They'll usually examine the New Testament, of course, but they'll also look at non-biblical Greek writings, and they'll look at the Septuagint. Now, you might ask, what is the Septuagint? And I'm glad you asked that. Now, I'm sure you remember from your studies in ancient history who Alexander the Great was. And it was due to his conquest that the Greek language was spread far beyond the borders of Greece, including into Israel. The Greek language became more and more common, and by the 2nd and 1st centuries BC, most people in Israel spoke Greek as their primary language. So because of that, the Hebrew Bible, what we refer to as the Old Testament, was translated into Greek so that the Jews who didn't understand Hebrew could read the scriptures in the language that they spoke, which was, of course, Greek. So the Septuagint, which is also known as the LXX, which you probably recognize as the Roman numeral for the number 70. Anyway, the Septuagint is a translation of the Hebrew Bible into the Greek language. The name Septuagint comes from the Latin word for 70, because according to tradition, there were 70 Jewish scholars involved in the translation of the Septuagint. So, as I was saying before, biblical scholars typically use three sources when they want to find the meaning of Greek words in the New Testament. And they'll look at the New Testament, of course. And I'm sure you know that the New Testament was written primarily in Greek. And they'll use non-biblical Greek writings. Uh, these are Greek sources that were written around the time that the New Testament was written. And then finally, they'll use the Septuagint. So by consulting these three sources, scholars are able to determine the meaning of key words that are used in verses pertaining to the substitutionary atonement of Christ. And in this case, uh, we're going to look at some prepositions, two prepositions. So regarding the substitutionary atonement of Christ, there's two Greek words, there's two prepositions that we're going to look at, anti and hyper. By the way, some scholars transliterate the word hyper using the letter U, while others use the letter Y, so you might see them either way in theological writings. Now, regarding this first preposition, anti, Dr. Charles Ryrie in his book, Basic Theology, states that anti in classical Greek means in the place of. He says it has no other meaning. It does not mean on behalf of. It means in place of, as in substitute. So in the New Testament and in non-biblical Greek writings and in the Septuagint, this is the only meaning of this word, anti. It means in place of. Okay, let's look at some examples in Scripture where this preposition is used. If we look at Luke chapter 11, verse 11, Christ is speaking and he says, Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? And the word there that is used instead of is the Greek word anti. We see here that word anti is translated instead of. So it does not mean on one's behalf. Clearly it is used here to mean substitution. Then the author of Hebrews states in Hebrews 12, 16, See to it that there is no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. Here again, we see the idea of substitution. 
in that Esau exchanged his birthright. In other words, he substituted his birthright for a bowl of stew. Dr. Ryrie writes that the crucial verse is Mark 10.45. 10.45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And the word for there is translated from the Greek word anti. So regarding this verse, Dr. Ryrie states the following. He says, Anti demands the interpretation that our Lord came to die in our place and as our substitute. It cannot be understood otherwise. And this, of course, was Christ's own interpretation of the meaning of his sacrifice. Dr. Ryrie also points out that anti also appears as the prefix on the compound word antilutron in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. And that verse says, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. And that word ransom is translated from the Greek antilutron, anti and lutron. Anti meaning substitution, and lutron meaning ransom. So Christ was our substitution ransom. Christ didn't just pay the ransom. He was the ransom. So we looked at the word anti. Now let's examine the use of the preposition hyper. Dr. Ryrie explains that for the word hyper, the original meaning of this preposition was over, upper, and for one's benefit. The idea included standing over someone to protect him and to receive the blows on his behalf and in his place. Dr. Ryrie continues, he says, thus the basic ideas in the word include both benefit and substitution, simply because to act on behalf of or for the benefit of someone often includes acting in his place. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And on behalf is translated from hyper. He died on our behalf. That is, he died for our benefit. And, that is, plus, he died in our place. Clearly in this verse, we can see benefit and exchange. We can see benefit and substitution. Let's look at another example. Let's look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Again, the word for is translated from hyper. So we see again, for our benefit, but we also see in our place. He died for our benefit, and he died in our place. Let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Again, for is translated from hyper, and it means for our benefit, and it means in our place. That is, substitution. So to summarize, Dr. Ryrie says this. He says, Anti always has the idea of equivalence, exchange, or substitution. It never has the broader idea of for the sake of or on behalf of. So Anti always means in our place. Hooper, on the other hand, has both ideas, including the idea of substitution in atonement passages in the New Testament. So anti means in our place, whereas Hooper has both ideas, for our benefit and in our place. You see, Jesus died in our place when he was crucified on the cross. We deserve to be the ones put on the cross to die because we are the ones who live sinful lives. But Christ took the punishment on himself in our place. He substituted himself for us and took what we rightly deserved. He died in our place, but in addition, his death paid the ransom. His death paid the penalty so that we could be set free from judgment. He died for our benefit. 
But believe it or not, there are people who deny that Christ died as our substitute, or there are others who downplay the significance of his substitutionary death. But as we said before, this great doctrine of the substitutionary atonement of Christ is the heart of the gospel. The Bible reveals that Christ died for us. He died not only for our benefit, but he also died in our place. Again, without it, there is no good news. There is no gospel. Now let's talk about Satan's role as the ruler of this world, or also referred to as the ruler of this age. As we have learned, and as depicted in this slide here, God's original design was to rule over man, and that was Adam, of course, the first man, and man, in turn, was to rule over the earth. Adam was to be God's theocratic administrator over creation. Adam was to essentially be God's king over the earth. But Adam sinned, and he lost the office of the theocratic administrator, and a curse came over all of creation. Now, when Adam was dethroned from his position as ruler of the earth, what happened in this void? Satan, the usurper, jumped in and seized dominion over this world. Okay, you probably noticed that I used the stereotypical image of the devil, but that was the easiest thing to find for this slide. Three times in the Gospel of John, Jesus himself refers to Satan as the ruler of this world. The Apostle John also writes in 1 John 5, 19, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And that, of course, is Satan. By the way, do you remember reading in the book of Luke when Satan tempted Jesus by offering the kingdoms of this world to him? We see that in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And Luke writes, And he, meaning Satan, led him, meaning Jesus, up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, he said to Jesus, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Satan told Jesus, for it has been handed over to me, and here's the important thing to notice. Jesus did not contest that statement. That means it must be true. So Satan must be the ruler of this world. If that were not true, the Lord would have corrected him, but he didn't. Now take a look at this part in verse 6. Satan says that the domain of the kingdoms of the world has been handed over to me. It's been handed over to me. That Greek word there is paradidomai, and it means to give into the hands of another, to deliver it to someone. So you might be asking, just like I used to ask, who handed over the dominion to Satan? And before we answer that question, let's look at another verse. We'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24. And it says, then comes the end. And what we're talking about is the end of the millennial kingdom, the messianic kingdom. Then comes the end when he, that is Christ, hands over the kingdom to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. And the same Greek word is used here, paradidomai, to give into the hands of another or to deliver. So let's go back and look at this again. That's the same word used in Luke. It was handed over to him. So when the devil says, it has been handed over to me, we see that he did not just illegally seize rulership for himself, but rather rulership was handed over to him. It was delivered to him. Okay, so who handed it over to him? Who's the one that handed the dominion of all the kingdoms of the world to Satan? Well, here's what Dr. Paul Benware says about this. He says, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them dominion over the earth, establishing the theocratic kingdom in Eden. However, when Adam and Eve sinned, they not only defected from God, but handed the ruling authority over to Satan. 
Ever since then, Satan has operated as the ruler of this world. You see, God handed the kingdom of the earth to Adam and Eve, and they handed it over to Satan. And now, Satan is the ruler of this world. Adam and Eve listened to the serpent and believed him rather than God. They then acted upon the snake's word rather than the word of God. They placed their trust in the serpent, that is, they placed their trust in Satan. They placed themselves under the authority of Satan and thereby handed leadership over to him. That's why Paul the Apostle calls Satan in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the God of this world or the God of this age. And the devil's dominion over this world is his domain of darkness, a domain from which God must rescue us, which he does when we trust in Christ. Look at Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. It says, For he, that's God, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Satan is also referred to as the prince of the power of the air. We see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. The prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. The sons of disobedience are the unbelievers, those who have not placed their faith in Christ. And the sons of disobedience, that is the unbelievers, are doing the bidding of the devil. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. With gentleness, that's us, we're supposed to be gentle when correcting people. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. You see, unbelievers are doing the will of Satan, whether they know it or not. They are doing his bidding. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And we know in this particular verse, Paul is referring to Satan as the God of this world. And he is blinding the minds of the unbelieving. Now you'll find some translations that say that Satan, rather than is the God of this world, in this passage they'll say he's the God of this age. Which is both true. He is the ruler of this present world system, or the present evil age, as Paul calls it in Galatians 1, verse 4. But this present evil age won't last forever. Now, we keep in mind that the devil is not all-powerful like God is, nor is he omnipresent like God is. In other words, he cannot be in every place at once. He can only be in one place at a time. So I believe that unbelievers are willfully blinded by Satan's world system. Now, another thing I want to talk about is that I've often heard people say that we are all children of God. But the Bible doesn't say that. Unbelievers are not children of God. They are children of Satan. Listen to what the Lord himself said to some unbelieving Jewish leaders. This is in John chapter 8, verse 44. He says, You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And this is what Genesis 3.15 told us, right? That unbelievers are the seed of Satan. They are his children. Not that he literally fathers them. Satan is an angel. Angels are spirits. They do not nor cannot father literal physical offspring. But rather, unbelievers are his children because they have sinful desires like he does. In other words, they act as if Satan is their father. You know, like father, like son. Now, Having said all that, keep in mind that, yes, Satan is the ruler of this world. The Bible tells us that. 
but he does not have 100% authority over this planet. He is the ruler, but he is still within God's universal kingdom, thereby is still under the authority and power of God. He's on a leash. If you've ever read the book of Job, you'll have seen an example of this. God restrains him when he's dealing with Job. Also remember that God did not grant rulership to Satan. Adam put himself and his posterity under Satan's authority. And even though Satan has this authority, Satan's control and power are limited, and they are limited by the permissive will of God. Nevertheless, he has caused a whole lot of pain, suffering, chaos, violence, evil doing, and just plain wickedness. Now, don't get me wrong. Fallen man doesn't need Satan. Man can do bad all by himself. But Satan influences rulers, governments, false religions, and entertainment. He often provides ideas and opportunities for sinful man to indulge himself in. By the way, you want to know why bad things happen in our world? Well, because a lot of it comes from the ruler of this world and the sinfulness of man. And because of that, we have evil in this world. And also, we want to remind ourselves that the evil happening today was never the design of God. He designed a world in which death didn't exist and evil didn't exist. Murder, violence, theft, cancer, disease, death of babies, and all these terrible things were never intended to be. These things were not the original design of God. But Adam listened to and believed and acted upon what Satan said. And he disobeyed God. And this world, which was very good, was forfeited. Paradise was lost. The kingdom was lost because of one man's rebellion. Sin entered into the world and death entered into the world. So we cannot blame God for all the evil on our planet. The beginning of evil in this world falls squarely on man. However, even though Satan may have a lot of influence in this world, we are not to worry because our God is still in control. He still directs history. Look at Psalm 47, 8. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Let's look at a few examples from Scripture which demonstrate that God still has authority and power over this world during this age. Listen to the words of the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 10. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I planned to bring on it. Or at another moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless it. Just like the example of the potter who can do with the clay as he wishes, God also has the power and authority to do whatever he wishes with the nations. This also is true of individuals. Now listen to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 and 12. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all, and in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. You see, it's by God's power and might that individuals are made great and given strength. 
And listen to what our Lord said, the Lord Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45. He said, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. You see, God not only lifts up and brings down nations and individuals, but because of his love for mankind, all of mankind, he provides sun and rain that we can grow food to eat. And we also notice here in this verse that we are to be like our father. Remember we just learned about Satan, like father, like son? Well, God is our father, and we are his children, and we are supposed to be like him, loving our enemies. God loves everybody. He loves even those people that are his enemies. Another example of how God is still working in our world, even though Satan is called the ruler of this world, God is still working here on this planet. And we see that because God often uses nations and their leaders to do his bidding, even if they don't realize it. And we see here in Isaiah that God used the nation of Assyria to punish the ten northern tribes of Israel. And we'll listen to Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 through 12. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hands is my indignation. I send it against a godless nation, and commission it against the people of my fury to capture booty and to seize plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. Yet it does not so intend, nor does it plan so in its heart, but rather it is its purpose to destroy and cut off many nations. When you see the word woe, it means something bad is going to happen, and we see that that woe is directed at Assyria. That means something bad is going to happen to Assyria. And we'll see that in verse 12, that God intends to punish Assyria. You see, God used Assyria as his rod of anger, as his instrument of judgment. And he used it against Israel and Judah. And he did the same using Babylon against Judah later on. And God here in these passages referred to Israel and Judah as a godless nation. Why did he refer to them as a godless nation? Because they had forsaken God and they were worshiping idols. And it says there that Assyria does not so intend, meaning it didn't intend to do this. It didn't intend to be God's rod of anger. Assyria did not realize that it was the Lord's instrument, but rather it thought its conquests were the result of its own power and might. But God was letting Assyria do these things, using them as his instrument of punishment. For it says, Are not my princes all kings. Is not Calno like Carchemish, or Hamath like Arpad, or Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has reached to the kingdoms of the idols, whose graven images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria. In these verses, Isaiah is listing other places that Assyria conquered. Shall I not do to Jerusalem and her images? just as I have done to Samaria and her idols. So it will be that when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the pomp of his haughtiness. And then in the end, God intended to punish Assyria after God had finished using that nation to punish Jerusalem. God used them, but nevertheless... He punished them because of their own pride and their own evil desires. So we see here that God can use nations to do his bidding, even when they have no clue that that is what is happening. And you may remember this from session one, where we read that an angelic messenger declared to Daniel the following in Daniel 4, 17. In order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. Also in session one, we read Nebuchadnezzar's declaration regarding the ultimate sovereignty of God. And we see that in Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 and 35, where Nebuchadnezzar says, I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, 
For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, What have you done? And the psalmist writes this, Psalm 135, 6. He says, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all the deeps. And one final example in which men may feel that they are acting according to their will and on their own accord, but behind them, God is moving to accomplish his purposes here on earth. We see that in this very important example. Peter is preaching to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, and he says this in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 23. He says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. You see that? God used evil men to do the evil of crucifying his son, but without which we would all be lost for eternity. And there are numerous examples in Scripture that demonstrate that God continues to work in this world And even though Satan is the ruler of this world, God is directing history. And that's what we're studying about. We're seeing how God is directing history in order to get to that future time in which the messianic kingdom, the millennial kingdom, will be established here on earth. Dr. Ice sums up the biblical theme of the messianic kingdom, that is God's kingdom on earth, by the following. He says, The Bible from Genesis to Revelation, views God's kingdom as a specific time within history, a time yet future upon planet Earth, when Israel will have come to belief in Jesus as their Messiah. The curse will have been removed apart from death, and Jesus will personally reign over planet Earth, literally, from Jerusalem. That's a good summary of what we are studying. Okay, We're going to stop here for today. Now, in our next session, we're going to look at a prophecy timeline. I think it's important to get a clear picture of the future timeline so that when you read prophetic scripture, you know where things fit in end times prophecy, that is eschatology. Okay, so what do I always tell you guys? I love you. Read your Bibles and pray. Hasta pronto.